Okay, uh, our next speaker for this evening is Jack SMP, and you've already seen how articulate she can be on the video. Jack is a feminist activist who focuses on internet rights, that's why she's here tonight, feminism and sexuality. She's also the women's rights policy coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communications, and she is a CIJ director. Jack will speak about the principles of human rights as they apply to the internet and how Article 114A impacts on this. Hello, Hello. Hello. Um, Yes, I'm the topic head, but the script is a collaborative effort, so I'm not really all that articulate. Um, I guess what I wanted to talk about today, and Chingam has covered quite a lot of, of it, is to try and really look more closely at the justification for why this amendment is necessary. So there's two main reasons that, was, that were given. One is that it's necessary to combat cybercrime, and two, anonymity is a problem, and we need to address this in order to try and gather evidence, because that's difficult. So looking at cybercrime, I'm very curious, because um, whenever somebody, whenever a government tries to forward a law that says that it's supposed to protect us, I get very suspicious. Uh, partly because I'm an activist, and partly and mainly because I'm a feminist, because it's always in our name. You no, know? we need to protect the women, we need to protect the children. But at the end of the day, it's not really protection of our rights; it's protection of identity, which is not necessary. Thank you very much. So. What is cybercrime and what are we talking about when we say that, you know, cybercrime is a problem, we really need to deal with this situation. We have many laws that actually touches on the issue of cybercrime, but I think the one that most directly defines it is the Computer Crimes Act of 1997. So what does it say cybercrime constitutes? There are several different things. One of the things is unauthorized access to someone's computer. So basically, I hack into your account, or I use a computer without permission, or so on, or steal your um, smartphone and use it, and so on and so forth. So it's unauthorized access, okay? Second is unauthorized access with the intention to commit a crime. So for example, if, I, if um, a husband logs into, logs into a wife's bank account and takes money out without her permission, that's a crime, and that's unauthorized access in order to facilitate the crime, okay? And then the third one is um, unauthorized modification of content in someone's computer. So for example, I can um, install a virus into your computer and make it change and do certain things. That's also considered as unauthorized modification of content, not just going into a computer and changing your name. Okay? And then it's also about um, wrongful communication of access information. So passing somebody your password or telling you know, somebody that you're not supposed to have this. And the punishments are quite severe. So that means, you know, that, and this is since 1997, and the World Wide Web was only in existence since 1992. So we're actually very progressive when it comes to laws around, you know, technology. So, um, and the punishment is something like ranging from, what is it, 100,000 to 150,000, and, you know, including um, uh, imprisonment and so on. So we really do take this quite seriously. But take a step back and think about what is the crime the cyber crime that is the issue here. It is about unauthorized access, meaning somebody hacking into your account, somebody unlawfully using a computer to do something else. In other words, it can also include things like impersonation, right? So how would the Evidence Act actually deal with this situation when it actually just says, okay, you come here and report to me that you have um, somebody hacked into your account and posted something, thank you for you know, are confessing that you've committed a crime. I'm just going to catch you now, thanks very much. Give me a computer. Section 10 of the Act actually allows the police to arrest you without a warrant, in fact, um, if they have reasonable suspicion to say that, you know, you are, you've committed a crime or are in the process of committing a crime. So the argument itself is already tripping against itself. It's illogical, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't protect who it's trying to protect. Then I was curious, actually, what are, the, what are the kinds of cybercrime that we are facing? Because clearly it is, I guess, a problem, right? And it is an emerging problem, and it is a, a, a serious problem that many governments around the world are trying to address. And we have issues like Trojans, like malware, like scams, like fraud. So what is it that we are facing in this country that we are so anxious to address? And I checked the cyber security, what is it? Cyber security Malaysia, which is the um, cybersecurity arm of MOSTI, Ministry of Science and Technology. 
So they have a hotline where people can call them when you have, um, you know, when you face issues around cybercrime. And if, uh, they don't really capture very good statistics, but according to one newspaper report, they said that they received 8,000 complaints, calls last year. And the majority of the cases that they find is around fraud. It's economically driven. So it's really around, so how many of you have received emails from somebody that you know to say that I'm stranded somewhere, can you please send me some money? How many? Ah, see. So, and how many of you have actually received SMSs or unwanted stuff from people to say, you know, come and join this thing, you will win some money, blah, blah, blah. How many? So this is the reality of the cybercrime that we are actually facing and actually needing some kind of serious concerted effort to address, right? Um, but what is this Evidence Act trying to do? It's targeting on a very specific thing, i.e. content. What it is actually interested in policing and regulating is speech. It's not about crime, it's about content. It's about what you say and narrowing the space that enables you to say particular things. And it's a one act sweeps all. Okay? Doesn't matter whether it's your whether, doesn't matter whether you publish it, doesn't matter whether it's your copy. I'm trying to cover everything. You know, your name, maybe it's not your name, it's okay, maybe it's your network, maybe it's somebody using your name, whatever it is, I'm just going to cover it all because it just makes my life easier. Compare it to cases of if you want to hmm, actually that's a it's not a very important point, so I'm not even gonna make that. Um, analysis because I was curious, you know, like cases of crime, right? How do we deal with this? Because this reverses the burden of proof. So I started checking statistics about, okay, what kind of economic crimes do we have? Burglary, you know, breaking into people's homes. I checked the police department. In Jan from January to February 2012, this year alone, there's 4,000 cases. Whole of last year, 8,000 cases of cybercrime complaints, and they justify a total reversal of the burden of proof. Whereas burglary, it's like, so what do we do? You know, it's also very difficult to trace, right? Because burglars don't leave behind their names, they don't even leave behind their IP addresses, so maybe we should just assume that everybody's a burglar. That makes my life easier. That's the kind of irrational logic that's operating behind this amendment that we really need to resist that because it just doesn't make sense. And then moving on to anonymity. And I think there is an incremental um, uh, move, there is a trend towards eroding anonymity and the right to anonymity more and more, not just in Malaysia but in many different countries. And what one of the things that this act does by holding intermediaries liable, meaning people who has shared Wi-Fi networks, so the Starbucks and the Papa Rich who give you free Wi-Fi, right? Um, and also people who, who um, publish blogs and alternative news sites. By holding all of these people liable for content, that is passing through, that doesn't originate from them, this causes a thing called chilling effect, right? What does it mean? So for me, if I still, because it's in my business model, it's very good for business if I give free Wi-Fi um, to people, but in order to protect myself, in case I can now, I will just make everybody register. Log in, give me, you know, your IC number, your full name, your home address, your favorite dog food, so on and so forth. So this means a culture of surveillance. And we're turning all of these people, private sector, citizens, individuals, ISPs, techies, we're turning all of them into policemen. And we're turning all of them into gatekeepers, and we're narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the spaces and the safeguards for our fundamental right to freedom of expression. And that is a key to democracy that we cannot let go of. And it's very, very important for us to realize that anonymity and the right to anonymity is a very critical principle for this to happen. In fact, the Special Repertoire for the Right to Freedom of Expression and Information last year um, presented a report to the Human Rights Council. Malaysia is a member of the Human Rights Council. We are very proud of it. We always have a lot of fanfare. You know, when we get re-elected, we're like, yeah. So, I encourage everyone, if you haven't read it, to just have a look at his report because it actually outlines all of the things that is necessary for a state to do. It's your obligation because you're part of this international, you know, you, have, you need to uphold to these international standards of fundamental human rights because you've signed on to this. The International Convention um, at the ICCPR, UDHR, all of these like, you know, acronyms and stuff and what you need to do. And everything that he, he um, recommends for governments to do in order to promote freedom of expression online, this is just absolutely opposite. It's very fun to read if you read it in light of this, and I'll stop here. Thanks.
very good. Thank you for stopping before Yoda, for having uh, for giving us such an articulate presentation and adding value to what has already been said. Um, you know, Jack has been pointing out that the amendment in Malaysia was comes on the heels of a landmark case in Thailand, and I'm sure you're familiar with that case, where an intermediary was found guilty of posting comments that were deemed to be insulting to the royal family on her website. Do you think that regional governments take a leaf from each other, and do you foresee that similar legislation happening in ASEAN countries? <laughs> Uh, yes, actually, um, and this is what is called policy importing. So we like to import policies from each other, and unfortunately, we are part of the Golongan that likes to import the worst case scenario. So another country that actually does this, that makes countries liable for third party content, is China. So uh, you see, lah, like where we like to emulate, in fact. Um, and in fact, one of the things to, if you are interested in cybercrime, is to have a look at the Cybercrime Convention. Uh, because that is another convention that is being replicated in many parts of the world to look at how to tackle cybercrime issues. But at least within the convention, there is safeguards for human rights, even though it's problematic. But something is there to work with. Whereas, um, I really don't know. I mean, we have the roadmap to human rights um, that's being discussed in ASEAN countries. And there is also, a, I think, a development plan um, to look at ICT for development. So, it's important to actually mention and highlight when ICT is constantly being raised for, um, under this development framework, um, that, the, that the enabling impact of internet for freedom of expression and for democracy is actually part of the Millennium Development Goals. So it's also part of like, you know, an understanding of development and not just economic development. 